Half Forgotten History is presented by State Farm. Getting great car or home insurance from State Farm at a surprisingly great rate? Well, that's just like talking to the biggest names in NFL history and hearing their untold stories. It's the real deal. So choose insurance that always brings its A-game. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You guys have the goggles on the helmets. Well, hold to on, this hold, day, hold on a coolest, sec. Hold you got on. it? They were fire. Hey everybody, I'm Trey Wingo. Welcome into a new endeavor for us. I have been covering sports for a long time, specifically the NFL. Gray hair, exhibit A, your honor. But one of the coolest things about my job all those years is getting to sit down and talk to some of the best players in football about the best moments in time. However, the problem was a lot of those conversations came off the set, in the green room, sometimes out to dinner, sometimes late at night with a favorite cocktail in her hand. In other words, you didn't get to hear the stories that I heard all the time. Well, that changes now with a little show we call Half Forgotten History, part of Trey Wingo Presents. The premise is really simple. Me, with one of my favorite athletes of all time in the NFL, talking about one of the greatest moments in the game that you've never heard about before. And as my friends know, Maker's Mark is my favorite bourbon, so if I'm sitting down to talk to some of my favorite people about their favorite stories, Maker's Mark is going to be a part of it. And we're launching Half Forgotten History with a well-known name. He's a Hall of Famer in Canton, Ohio, a guy whose story you could not script because Hollywood would say, that's too unrealistic. All he did was go from Northern Iowa to getting cut to the Arena League, to the World League of Football, to being a Super Bowl champion and a Hall of Fame quarterback. You know him, none other than Kurt Warner. Kurt, you know, there's a podcast out there called This American Life. And every time I hear the name of that podcast, I think they must be talking about Kurt Warner because <laughs> that sums up your entire life, right? You are the American dream. To one degree. I mean, obviously, we're, we're still talking about a football career as opposed to uh, life in general. So, you know, you could say that I fit into that mold. Um, but once again, you know, I, we know it, it's sports, yeah. it's football. There's, there's a lot bigger things in life than that. Um, but I do think life is so much about the struggles and the trials and, and the journey and being able to overcome them and realize that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. And so that's kind of the coolest thing to me of my journey is that a lot of people can really relate to that in life, wherever they're at and wherever they've been and whatever they may be going through at that particular moment. It reads like a Hollywood script and it is gonna be made into a movie, which is which is yeah. kind of cool, but let, let's sort of peel back a little bit here. You had a good, good career at Northern Iowa. You get an opportunity with the Green Bay Packers and it didn't work out. So you're bad. for those that don't know, the four people that don't know the Kurt Warner story at this point, you're stocking groceries at the Hy-Vee grocery store and how did you find your way back into football from there? When I got released by the Packers, you know, the goal was simply, hey, get another opportunity. You know, somebody else has got to give me a chance at some point. And so, you know, at that particular time, there weren't a lot of opportunities for me to play football. And, you know, that was, I think, the, the hardest part is as you're going through it, you know, you believe you can play, but it's just like, okay, where are these opportunities in sports there's usually not a lot of opportunities to play professional sports. Um, and so as I was working in the grocery store, uh, you know, I was, you know, sending out, you know, tapes to people. I was writing letters. I, I was, uh, you know, reaching out to all these teams, you know, whether it be, you know, teams in NFL Europe, um, you know, or NFL teams to maybe give me another shot to try out. But really what happened was I got a number of calls from the Arena Football League. And, you know, here I am stocking shelves in a grocery store and I, I'm thinking to myself, I am so much better than arena football. I do not want to play arena football. I don't know much about it. <laughs> Nobody watches it. And so I told the arena league no a couple times because I'm like, no, I've, I'm NFL material. I'm, I'm going to make it back into the NFL. And, you know, after a couple months of going, okay, nobody from the NFL or those higher leagues are, are calling. Um, the Iowa Barnstormers were just being established in the Arena League. And so their coach had called me because their coach knew my coach from college and, and you know, through, you know, through the grapevine, it was like, hey, you need to give this guy a shot. So they called me um, and asked if I would come down and, and try out for the team. And it really became one of those things where, as you mentioned, you know, my wife-to-be, but my girlfriend at the time and her two kids were in Iowa. Um, you know, Des Moines was just a couple hours down the road from where we were 
And so I thought, well, it's better than five fifty an hour at a grocery store. And maybe more importantly, it's playing football. And I think sometimes, you know, people miss that part of it is that, um, A, I wanted to play. I just love to play football. So I wanted to play. And B, playing football is always better than not playing football. And, you know, so working in a grocery store and, you know, working out and trying to get another opportunity was never going to be as beneficial as actually playing. I needed to play football. I needed to get out there and not only get better as a football player, but also, you know, have a chance to show people I'm still playing and I'm playing at a high level. And maybe that would parlay itself into an NFL opportunity. So went and played arena football for three years. And ironically, the, the, the way I got back into the NFL, um, there was a coach, Al Luganville, who was coaching in NFL Europe at the time. So sure. back when yeah. they had NFL Europe and he had actually called me in 1996. So it was my second year in arena league. And he said, you know, I, I like what you're doing in the arena league. I'd love for you to come over and, and play for me in Amsterdam. And I told Al, Hey, if you can get me an opportunity, just get me a tryout, a, a, get, get me signed by an NFL team. So I know I can go to another training camp. And if you do that, I'll leave what I have in arena league and I'll come play for you in Europe. Yeah. He, he, he went on and he called a number of teams and nobody was interested. So he called me back and just said, you know, I, I can't get you a tryout, but I would still love for you to play for me in Amsterdam. And, you know, at that point in time, although the arena league wasn't great, um, I had a pretty good gig there. I was successful. You know, I didn't want to give that up, uh, you know, for just a, a shot in the dark. So, so I actually told uh, Al, you know, thank you, but, but no thanks. I'm going to pass. And amazingly enough, Al called me back a year later and said, hey, I got the same proposition for you. I'd love for you to come play in Europe for me. And, you know, maybe you can, you know, turn that into another opportunity. And I gave him back the same proposition. You get me signed by an NFL team and I will uh, I'll come over and play for you. So long story short, he got the Rams to bring me in for a tryout. And it was an awful tryout. I mean, it was the worst tryout of my life. I remember calling my wife as I was driving out of Rams Park going, oh, my gosh, I just blew my last opportunity in the NFL. There's no way they're going to sign me after that. A couple days later, I got a call from the Rams. They wanted to sign me to a contract. To this day, I believe it was solely as a favor to Al. Like, Al, okay, we'll sign him to a contract so you can have him in Europe, um, and, and then we'll go from there. But they signed me to the contract. I went over and played for Al and, um, you know, and then I got my opportunity with the Rams in training camp that year. And as they say, the rest is history. You may not know this, but I actually called a game in the arena league when you were playing because I was in St. Louis at the time for the St. Louis stampede. Sure. Yeah. And we played that game in, in the old, uh, that old arena in Des Moines. And for those people that don't know, the Iowa Barnstormers may have the coolest helmets in the history of football. And you guys had the goggles on the helmets. Well, hold on, this hold, day, hold on a second. You on. got it? You have it. The, the Iowa Barnstormer helmet is the coolest helmet you will ever see. And there it is. Look at it. There Those are. are the goggles. See? With the goggles on there. Yes. Those are the we goggles had, right there. We had propellers on our pants. It was, it was, uh, they were fire. They were amazing. I get more compliments and more comments on those uniforms, those helmets, and what have you than any uniform that, that I've ever worn. And you credit, actually, now because you didn't want to do it, but you credit the Arena League with really helping you develop as a quarterback because how fast the ball has to come out in that league. There's no doubt that the Arena League helped me and helped to shape who I became as a quarterback because when you talk to people you know, after my career in the NFL, those are the same things they're going to say. He processed yeah. information really fast. He was accurate. He could get the ball out of his hands extremely quickly. And all of those things were things you had to do in arena football. So whether I had those traits and they got to show up in arena football or if arena football taught me those things, ultimately those would be the things that would define who I was as a football player. And so I am. I'm so grateful to the Arena League for uh, giving me the opportunity to play because I needed to play football. You know, I hadn't played much in college. I needed to play football. Uh, it taught me some of those skills that would really become, you know, defining factors for me in my career. And, and the mentality of it. You know, I think that was something that people don't really connect is that the mentality in arena football is, A, you're going to throw every snap. So everything is on the quarterback. And B, you're expected to score every single time you touch the football. 
And so that's a completely different mentality than the NFL. And so when I came into the NFL and we had so much success in St. Louis, you know, people were always asking me like, oh, did you see this kind of success? Or, you know, how are you guys scoring so much? And I remember being frustrated. I'm like, man, we pump three times a game. This is ridiculous. <laughs> we got to find a way to score every time we touch the football. So my mentality as a quarterback was completely different than I think a lot of people. And, you know, especially in that era where it was like, three yards in a cloud of dust and you know it's more about defense and running the football than scoring my mentality was completely different because of what I learned in arena football yeah okay so that got you to the NFL we're going to take a break here when we come back we'll talk about your NFL career and one of the greatest sentences ever uttered by a head coach in NFL history that no one believed at the time but might have been the most truthful statement ever made you know, here in the East Coast, and quite frankly, across the country, McDonald's just isn't this large global restaurant. It's a local one, too. Much in the same way, these Hall of Fame athletes that you see me talking to are also people that live and work in the communities and towns where they are. McDonald's are owned and operated by people that live in those communities. And when you eat at a McDonald's, you're supporting a local business. You might even be supporting your neighbor's business. And McDonald's franchises also care about the communities that they're in. That's why they give back to the local Ronald McDonald chapter houses and why they help first responders, like when they gave hot, fresh meals to those out there fighting the devastation of Hurricane Laura. When you own a McDonald's, you are committed to serving the community where you do business. McDonald's, serving here. Remember, State Farm gets you surprisingly great rates. So when you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. So time to fill your glass as we continue our conversation with Kurt Warner and his surprisingly great NFL career. He was the backup to Trent Green before the 1999 season began. And everybody knows, or people may have forgotten, in the final preseason game against the Chargers, Trent Green, who had not thrown an incomplete pass in that game, he was on fire, ready to roll, gets his knee blown out by Rodney Harrison, and done for the year. And, and Trent was a kid from St. Louis. I mean, he went to Vianney High School. I remember covering him. Then he got drafted. It was this amazing thing. And he's going to do all this stuff in his hometown. And the team was just devastated. It's like someone let the air out of a balloon. And then Dick Vermeil, who, by the way, should be in the Hall of Fame, said this sentence, and literally nobody believed him at the time, right before the start of the 1999 season. We will rally around Kurt Warner and play good football. And everyone was like, yeah, right. <laughs> and then you go in like a freaking supernova and the greatest show on turf begins. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we joke about that all the time uh, because, you know, when he uttered that statement, there were also tears coming out of his eyes. So yeah. we're not sure uh, what the <laughs> tears were for at that particular time. Like, Even he I, didn't believe it. Right. I'm going to try to get everyone to believe this, <laughs> including myself, but I'm going to be crying at the same time because – you know, here's the thing you have to realize, too, is that Dick was in his third year with the Rams. And so yeah. it was almost 20 years in between his stint with, with Philadelphia and then coming back with the Rams. And everybody at that point in time was saying, okay, you know, maybe it's past Dick up. He can't yeah. do this. You know, it's not going to happen. So everybody knew this was the final year. This was it. And Trent came in and gave us a belief in what we could be. And then he suffers the injury. And now they have to go to a backup quarterback. So – there's so many emotions going on here because I really felt like Dick was going, okay, we've got this. You know, we brought in Marshall Falk. Uh, we drafted Torrey Holt. You know, Trent's playing great. Okay, we got a chance to turn this around and, and I'll salvage this part of my career. And then the injury and then that statement. You know, I think that line was, of course, directed at me um, and that we were going to play good football. But I think there's a hidden message there too that, you know, Dick Vermeil is this guy that, you know, everybody's looking at and saying, okay, we can't win with this guy. This guy, you know, it's passed him up. And the hidden message is that, you know, him kind of saying that or us understanding that uh, we're going to rally around Dick for meal as well. And we're going to play good football, that he's a good football coach. And he's built this thing the right way. Um, you know, the way he liked to go around doing things and the way he established certain things. And then some of the changes that he made going into that year, bringing in Mike Martz, um, you know, giving some of the reins over to Mike to be able to run the offense the way that he wanted to. Um, and so there was a, there, I think there was a lot of emotions there from Dick understanding his situation and what this meant. Um, and then also trying to believe that, Hey, here's this guy 
that, you know, that we really do believe in. We're just not quite sure how much we believe in him at this particular time. Um, you know, and, and I'll even go back to when, you know, when I found out I made the team the year before. So I was the backup in, in, in 1998, which a lot of right. people don't remember. But uh, I was on the team in 1998, and I was told I made the team actually in the hallway. I ran into Dick Vermeil on cut day, and he came up to me and said, you know, Kurt, just want you to know that you've made the team, that it really came down to, you know, when I see you, I feel like there's something different and something special about you. And I can't let you go without seeing if that's true. And so Dick had told me this a year before that he had seen something that was different. And, you know, obviously I didn't get any opportunities to really prove that other than in practice the year before. And I was the, you know, scout team player of the year and that stuff. But, um, but I think that next year in that statement was, we think we know what we have here. We think there's something special in this guy and we're going to rally around him and play good football. Although, you know, just like you said, Nobody, nobody knew. I think I was the only one that truly believed um, that I would play good football. We knew the team would, was good enough to play good football, but I was probably the only one that truly believed that I would play football in a similar fashion to the way that I did. Well, you came out of the gate strong. I think you're 28 of 44, 309 yards, three touchdowns in that first win over the Ravens. And, and that was it. You guys just went rolling. You mentioned that you had the belief. How hard was it before that? when nothing was working for you to continue to have that belief? Because that's the hardest part of, of this whole thing, right? If you know you're good enough and it's not working, it, the hardest part is to not buy into what everyone else is telling you. You know, here's the thing is a lot of people will look at my career and they'll go, "Yeah, he sat on the bench for four years in college and then he got cut by the Green Bay Packers and then, you know, worked in a grocery store and then played arena league, which nobody knows anything about. And when I look back at my career, I say, well, I played one year in college and I was the player of the year in our conference. Yeah, I played three years in arena football and I was the best quarterback in the arena league and I went to two championships in three years. And so every time I had stepped on a football field, I was successful. And so it wasn't hard for me to believe that whatever the next opportunity was, I was going to be successful. The hardest part was to believe that somebody was going to give me that opportunity. That was the hardest thing to, to keep fighting through was, you know, not the belief in myself, but the belief that somebody is going to see it or somebody is going to take a chance on giving me that opportunity. And that was the most frustrating part. And so that to me was the real struggle. Uh, And I think the struggle for a lot of people is that a lot of people have skills and they have talent. It's just, we need somebody to take a chance on us. We need somebody to see in us what we see in ourselves. And that was really why I shared that story about Dick was that, when nobody else saw it, I mean, nobody else, you know, really wanted to keep me. Dick saw something that was a little different and he was willing to take a chance because isn't that so much what life is about? You know, no matter what career you're in, somebody has to take a chance and believe in you for you to be able to, you know, to step into, you know, what you are and and to accentuate your talent and to step into your purpose. And so I was very fortunate that I came across the path of Dick Vermeil and he gave me an opportunity that I don't believe many, if any others would have given me. And, you know, that was the beautiful part of it is that I had my belief and I had the belief of my coach. Um, And so when I actually got my opportunity, I was ready to play. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't the question. And so everybody else was surprised that I played well. I wasn't surprised at all. I mean, I, I felt like I was going to play well. Now, I don't know if I expected to play as well as we did right off the bat, but I expected myself to play well. And so um, so, you know, back to your point, it wasn't really the belief in myself that ever was questioned or that I ever doubted. It was simply, will I ever get a chance to truly prove myself um, at the next level and prove that I can play? Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because I hate it when people say someone, I'm a self-made man. There's no such thing as a self-made man. You can have your belief in yourself. Someone has to give you an opportunity to show what you can do. So whenever I hear that phrase, I'm like, don't tell me that. Everybody needs a helping hand at some point. But you, you had that opportunity. You took it. You guys went to the Super Bowl that year, got through a very difficult game in the NFC title game, and, and you finally get there, and you're playing the Titans. And, and Tennessee's defense was giving you guys some fits. Did you ever feel like the offense wasn't going to click? Were you be, was there any doubt at all in that game? Well, I think the most frustrating part of, of that game, Trey, was not that they were stopping us. I mean – 
you know, I don't know what we ended up with. We ended up with 450 total yards of offense or something. We were moving the ball up and down the field. We just couldn't finish. And that's always the most right. frustrating part because we felt like throughout most of that year, we were, we, you know, we were pretty much unstoppable, that nobody was going to stop us except us. And that's really what was happening in that game is we were moving the ball all over and, you know, we'd miss a kick or, or you know, we have a bad hold on, on a kick or we get down to the red zone and I missed Ricky Prohl, uh, you know, on an easy throw uh, at the end of the half that would have gave us a touchdown. I hit Torrey on one that kind of hit him in the hands. It got knocked out right as he was crossing the goal line. So there was numerous opportunities and we weren't taking advantage of those opportunities and finishing. And there's nothing more frustrating as a player than to feel like you can do whatever you want, but then you can't make the play when you yeah. really need to make the play. And, and that's really what that game came down to is we allowed the Titans to stay in the game because we couldn't finish. Uh, and that was unlike us. You know, we were, we were a finishing team. We were a scoring team. Um, and so that was to me the most frustrating part of that game was, you know, and probably leaning back to the NFC championship game where we end up scoring 11 points uh, in that game is, okay, why can't we finish here? What, what's happened these last couple of weeks that we yeah. can't get the ball in the end zone uh, and do what we're, we're accustomed to doing? To me, the coolest thing about Super Bowl 34 is that it was supposed to be a St. Louis kid in Trent Green who would lead the Rams to a Super Bowl championship. But it ended up being a St. Louis kid that made sure you guys won the game <laughs> because Kevin Dyson, the Titans wide receiver, was tackled on the one-yard line. One-yard line! In a, in a seven-point game by Mike Jones, who was a kid that played high school ball in St. Louis, I still to this day call that the greatest tackle in Super Bowl history. I will not doubt that. I will second that opinion. And what I love so much is that, you know, football to me is the ultimate team sport. And Absolutely. that was what was so beautiful about that year and kind of the way we finished that season because everybody, all they were talking about was our offense and our weapons, and the greatest show on turf, and, and all of that stuff. And what was lost in that was how good our defense was and the difference-making players we had on our defense. And I believe that, you know, you can have certain players that can elevate you to the point to getting you to a Super Bowl. To win Super Bowls, 99% of the time, it takes an entire team effort to do that. Amen. And it took not only a big play on offense, but it took a big play on defense to really solidify that win and we saw that the week before in the NFC Championship game. And us as a team, we knew that. But we never felt like our defense got the recognition that they deserved. And so I think that was the beautiful, poetic part of that Super Bowl was it took both sides of the ball. And it took huge plays and iconic plays on both sides of the ball to win the Super Bowl. And that's what I love about it is that it's 53 guys having to come together and everybody playing their role. You know, when I go to speak to, to people that play other sports – you know, the, the beautiful thing when you play basketball is if you're not shooting well one night, you can make a difference on the defense event, right? right? In football, you don't do your part on offense. You've got to sit on the sidelines and watch and hope that the rest of your team does their part. You've got no say in what happens on the other side of the ball. And so that's the poetry of it is that I need everybody out there to help me to be successful and they need me to help them be successful and so it takes all of us. And it took all of us that year, even though it was the offense that, uh, that got a lot of the recognition. Our defense was huge that year. And I think it was the epitome of that was that tackle by Mike Jones there on the one yard line to, uh, to solidify that Super Bowl for us. So then you get what I like to call your bonus Super Bowl, right? You, you went through the giant experience and you were there and the team was winning, but they drafted Eli. So you knew he was coming in. Uh, and you end up in Arizona. And at that point, Arizona was the place of last resort in the NFL. But you had that magical season uh, that got you to Super Bowl 43. And I'll never forget when you guys beat the Eagles uh, in the NFC Championship game, you said, yes, the Arizona Cardinals are going to the Super Bowl because nobody believed it at that time that the Cardinals were capable of it. You know, maybe in a negative way, but uh, you know, I felt like when I went to Arizona, it was like a match made in heaven that nobody ever expected the Arizona Cardinals to have success. Uh, nobody expected me at that point in my career to ever have success again. So I thought, well, this could be a perfect storm is, you know, we've got a chance to do something that is completely unexpected and what people believe is impossible. And, you know, when I first got there, I understood why people thought it was impossible. Um, yeah. You know, there was a lot of things within that organization 
uh, that I came in and, you know, you just kind of shake your head like, okay, I can't believe that they've been doing things this way. How, how do they ever expect to win, you know, doing <laughs> things this way? <clears throat> and so that became part of the mission when I got there it was not just to have success on the football field, but to, you know, to build a culture. And, you know, we throw that word around, you know, all the time is, is building a culture and changing a culture within an organization. But that really is what it took in Arizona. It, take, it took changing the mindset uh, of everybody from the top down that, you know, we don't ever want to just be good enough. We don't just want to punch the clock and, you know, be a part of the NFL. We want to make sure that we do things in such a way that we can be different and we can separate ourselves. And it was a huge challenge to be able to change the mindset uh, of, of people, like I said, it, and it started on the top down to get them to believe uh, that we could win and what it would take to win and what their commitment had to be. And the same with players that, you know, I remember early on when I got there, you know, after one of our first few practices, uh, you know, I invited, invited Larry Fitzgerald and some of the other players over to the house uh, to have dinner and just to get to know them a little bit. And, you know, my wife's prerequisite was, okay, no football talk. No shop talk. We, uh, we're just going to have a meal, and we're going to get to know these guys, and, uh, and then we'll move on from there. But, you know, my mind doesn't work like that, so I did the best that I could. But in the middle of the meal, <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't help but think about it something. It just had to come out. I it know, had to come out. Something in practice that, that was just sticking with me. And so, you know, I looked over at Larry, and I'm like, hey, Larry, on this particular play in practice, hey, I, I really want you to try it this way, and it'll help me, and I think it will help you. And, and – you know, you've got the ability to be one of the greats that, you, you know, you just need to fine tune some of the things. And, you know, I remember, you know, my wife kicking me under the table and Larry kind of smiling a little bit. And, you know, his <laughs> response was to me, like, was like, hey, Kurt, you know, you don't need to worry about me. I'm, you know, I'm already pretty good. You know, I'm, I, I'm good enough. You know, and his, his mindset wasn't out of arrogance of, oh, I, I'm good. You don't ever have to, to worry. It was simply, hey, if you're going to worry about somebody, I'm the last one here you need to worry about. You need to go fix everything else that's going on right. and then come back and talk to me when we're actually in a position to succeed. And so that was kind of the mindset that was there is that it was so much about, I don't think we're ever going to win. You know, if I'm a Larry Fitzgerald, I don't know if we're, they we're ever going to do what we need to do to win. So my job is to just be the best that I can be and, and try to separate myself individually as opposed to building a culture and building you know, a place that believes they can be successful. And so it was uh, probably the biggest challenge uh, of my career. But when it's all said and done, it was, you know, one of the, uh, the proudest moments of my career was to leave Arizona in the position that, you know, and I say I, it obviously wasn't just me, but when I sure. retired, to know Arizona was in a different place. And they believed a different way. And the possibilities became endless. And the organization started to see, okay, what we need to do to be successful. This is how it starts. This is the mindset we have to have. And it's got to trickle through everybody. And so um, it, was, it was a tough time, especially early. But it was extremely, extremely rewarding by the time it was all done. Well, listen, it's fitting that you say that. And we'll, we'll end it with that because – Wherever you've been, it's been about more than football. It's been about, can I make a positive impact in my community, in my life, in the world? And you continue to do that with your foundation. So give us a little information about what you're doing there. Well, yeah, we've got a couple of things. So we've got my First Things First Foundation, which was my player foundation that I started back in 2001. Uh, so we're continuing to do our work in different ways. Uh, we've adopted work, done Home for the Holidays program, where we help to give home ownership to single, you know, single parents, around the, the country. Um, we connect with Make-A-Wish families. Uh, we take them to Disney World with us every year. So going all the way back to the Super Bowl in 1999, I developed a relationship with Disney. When I got to do, I'm going to Disney World. Um, and so since then, we've been taking Make-A-Wish families to Disney World every single year um, and being able to spend a week with them and, and truly have an impact and, and allow them to have an impact on my family. So we continue to do those sorts of things in the different communities that we've been in from Iowa to, to here in Arizona. And we continue to work in St. Louis. Um, a second foundation that we started a couple years ago is, is called treasure house. Uh, and you had mentioned it a little bit earlier. My oldest son, Zach suffered a traumatic brain injury when he was four months old. 
Um, and after he graduated from high school, there really we really couldn't find a place for him to fulfill his purpose and to use his unique gifts and skills uh, and be a part of a community uh, of you know residents and peers like him. And so we created a place called Treasure House, which is a community living facility for young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's been open for a couple years. Our first one, I should say, has been open for a couple years here in Arizona. It's thriving. It's uh, it's about to be full to capacity. And the families that uh, are part of it have been impacted. The young men and women have been impacted in huge ways. We're looking to uh, to expand that. Once we get it right and figure it out, we look to expand that around the country. So every family like ours, every young man or, or woman like Zach has an opportunity to uh, to move forward and have a purpose in life. Um, and then, you know, we all know we're sitting here doing this on Zoom, which we probably wouldn't have done a year ago. Um, yeah. But, you know, life has changed and the pandemic has changed a lot of things. And one thing that I've always wanted to do was have an impact on the next generation uh, through this game and, and in this game. And so I've actually uh, been in the process through this pandemic as a number of things have been shut down. And I've done a number of Zoom meetings and, and calls with coaches and players around the country. I'm in the process of developing a teaching instruction platform that I call QB Confidential, um, in which I'm going to teach on the field, off the field, classroom, playbook, uh, use my story to inspire, um, you know, but to instruct and teach the game of football uh, to the masses across the country. And so it's given me an opportunity and the time to be able to really dive in and develop that. Uh, I'm hoping to launch it at the beginning of the year. And I think it's going to be really, really unique and different. Um, but it's going to be something that everybody has access to. And hopefully through my story and my journey and my experience in the game, that I'll help other people to be able to write their unique story and uh, maybe one day uh, be on a call with you uh, talking about uh, – their unique journey, just like I'm able to do that. Well, listen, I'm not sure in the history of the NFL there's a more unique, interesting, and crazy journey than yours. I, Kurt, I always enjoy talking with you, whether we're doing something like this or when we were part of that the, that virtual draft. That was certainly something. Listen, it's always good to catch up with you. Uh, cheers to you, my friend, and to all your success, and we look forward to talking real soon. Thanks, my man. I look forward to it as well. And that'll do it for the inaugural episode of Half Forgotten History. Our thanks to my friend Kurt Warner for being so generous with his time. And because of that, we're sending a check to Ronald McDonald House in Kurt's name for spending so much of his day with us. And thanks to Maker's Mark. Remember to pour yourself into everything you do and reach for a bourbon that's made with that personal touch. In fact, why don't we do this? Let's raise a toast right now to Kurt and all the incredible athletes who will be joining us on Half Forgotten History and celebrate their achievements. And remember, Maker's Mark crafts their bourbon carefully. All they ask is that you enjoy it the same way. So thanks for the first edition of Half Forgotten History. Many more to come, including one with our next guest, the guy who's in the Cowboys ring of honor and the all-time leading tackler in Dallas Cowboy history, Darren Woodson. We'll see you then.